Uh, welcome to the SRFU um, uh, webinar. Um, we've got our partners, um, the RFU uh, education team with us and, and Bucks. Um, we felt it was really important to um, run a follow-up session following um, our AGM and Q&A earlier in the year. Um, it's, it's a really challenging time for, for everybody at the minute. Um, everything keeps changing a lot um, uh, as, as we're all experiencing. Uh, and we've uh, felt as the SRFU, it's really important to keep our, our university members up to date as, as much as possible uh, as things progress. The, the plan for um, this afternoon is we've got an hour. We're, we're going to move through it as quickly as possible and as promptly as possible. Um, so we will be um, hearing from uh, Mark Solbosch from the RFU first to, to give us an update um, on, on what's happening within the RFU. Uh, then Jenny Morris from Bucks is, is going to join us. Um, and give an update from, from Bucks. And, uh, and my colleague, Katie Young from the SRFU is going to tell um, everybody a little bit more about a, um, a development fund that we have available to, to university clubs to, to help them through the COVID period. Um, then uh, after that, we're gonna move on to the Q&A, uh, which will be hosted by uh, Phil Mooney, our um, SRFU trustee member. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to Mark Saltmarsh, so I think might be sharing a, a couple of slides uh, and take us through uh, the RFU's uh, current position. Over to you, Mark. All right, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Hopefully it'll work. Right. Hopefully you can you can see that. I think so. Um, the it's great to be able to follow up from the from the session back in July, um, and and just to to back what Mark has said. Uh, obviously, acknowledging everyone's in a really challenging time at the moment, and we're all trying to do our best to get the game up and running again. And what I was going to do is just uh, is follow on from that first session and talk a little bit about where we are on the return to rugby uh, roadmap in that respect. Uh, and and then uh, a little bit more about some of the recent updates to uh, our phase and also how we, we try to draw together all the information that will help you uh, and support our universities to be able to uh, look at how they get rugby going as well. Uh, so first of all, uh, on the screen there, you can see our, our return to rugby roadmap um, for the community game. And we, we find ourselves now at, at phase D on the roadmap uh, as of uh, the... the uh, second half of August um, and slight updates to that in September as well that I'll, I'll talk about uh, in relation to some of the changes to government guidance and, and the road map, road map remember is all about us returning to play and having a phased approach uh, where we add elements of the game each time uh, based on the uh, team sport recreational framework uh, that looks at how we research monitor measure the, the transmission uh, and infection risks of of playing our sport. Um, importantly, and we'll come on to this in a second, it, it's also about the, the format of what happens outside of the pitch as well, uh, which is really important. And uh, it was good at the beginning of September that we, were, we had confirmation from DFE uh, for schools and colleges, but also has, has impact on universities as well, uh, that, that DFE guidance was also to follow, uh, just like the DCMS guidance, to follow NGB approved plans as well. So it did mean that everything came much more into line, which was a, a real um, boost for us all actually. So, so that's our return to rugby roadmap. We find ourselves at stage D now uh, and have been for a while. And for those of you who aren't aware, that means that we can, we can now play uh, non-contact rugby and uh, we've introduced the new form of, of touch called uh, Ready for Rugby to enable that to be done, a, a two touch game. Uh, as well as our O2 Touch uh, version as well. Uh, so that, that can now be played uh, by, by teams against each other. So, so two student teams could, could play against each other in that non-contact form of the game. Uh, and in addition to that, we're now in a position where uh, limited contact training can also take place. And this graphic here shows you the areas that that is. And just very briefly, that's the, the tackle. So a one versus one tackle. Uh, waist high or below, um, the uh, not upright tackling, uh, the ruck, so we can add two, uh, two players, one from each team, to that tackle situation, 
uh, for a short technical contest to practice rucking over the ball. And then the, the other area is an unopposed line out drill as well. So working on lifting the jumper, uh, throw and catch. So those are the areas of contact that can take place. And as it says there, that activity in a session mustn't take more than 15 minutes. That 15 minutes could be spread out um, in three, five minute sessions or whatever, but mustn't exceed 15 minutes of that contact training. And that training must be in groups of maximum six players per group. Um, so we've moved on, which is good. And currently our, um, our next submission is, is in with government to, to move to phase E and on to phase F as well. And we're looking in that to provide some, uh, some more certainty around when those movements will take place. Now that was submitted last Wednesday and uh, everything was looking good at that point. And then lots of things that we're all aware of happened on Thursday, uh, which has put a bit of a spanner in the works. So um, our submission is still in and we're waiting to hear what the, the changes over the last week, are, what impact they're going to have on that submission. So um, clearly some of the, the um, developments of the virus that, that have taken place since then uh, are going to affect our ability to be able to move along the roadmap. Um, but we will wait and, and hear what's said um, and then turn around what we get back from uh, DCMS, Government, Public Health England and Number 10 uh, to, to provide support like this for the game. Uh, the, the other thing that just is, is very much worth mentioning, uh, because it will be certainly as students come back into universities, it will be really relevant around the sort of intramural activity that you do, is what happens to spectators. And this is where we, we have needed to update our uh, guidance uh, alongside phase D. And now we're talking about six person groups. So, that, so the rule of six does apply to people off the pitch and some really um, strict rules around making sure that, that people are in groups of six when they're watching and spectating, that those groups are socially distanced from each other as well as those six people within the group. Uh, and that guidance, this is just an extract from one of our um, community game updates and that guidance is now within uh, the, the guidance that we've got as well. Uh, and what we've done is pulled together all of our um, all of our various guidance around the roadmap, uh, things that can help you get started, ready for rugby that I talked about earlier as a format of the game, uh, competitions calendar, uh, training for for students and staff as well, all into one place in the return to rugby kit bag. And many of you will have seen this from the information that's come out in the SRFU newsletters and uh, on uh, Twitter, etc but we're trying to direct everyone to, to this place because what we're making sure we do is keep the information behind each of these blocks at the bottom that are click-throughs uh, up to date. Uh, and that left-hand column there, the return to rugby column is a really key one. So if you go to englandrugby.com slash education, the updated version of the kit bag will always be through the link there. And that means you've got everything to, to start a rugby program in whatever format it might be in your university. And the final point I'd make is that we completely understand that there are a number of uh, decisions around movement of students, transport, travel, um, academic considerations, uh, on campus, off campus, all those sorts of things that also need to be made. Uh, so, so only as long as a university uh, is comfortable to, to move to stage D or whatever phase it is on the Ready for Rugby roadmap, would we expect them to do so? It's absolutely the decision of, uh, in education, the school, college or university to move when they're ready to. And what we're hopefully doing is providing a framework uh, to enable you to do that. So I'm going to pass over now to Jenny, uh, who's going to talk from the Bucks perspective. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, Mark. Um, yes, yeah, so no slides from me just hopefully a, a comprehensive but concise kind of update in terms of where we are from a Bucks perspective uh, for our planning for, for this season. So as you know, we've staged team entries this year. Uh, we did that across three windows to support members in terms of their planning for this coming season. Window two uh, for the term two Bucks Leagues competition, so the main programme that hopefully you're aware is going to run between January and April this year. Uh, the deadline for window two closed on Friday, the 18th of September. We have that stage process to enable us to monitor entries um, and to do some modeling around kind of where entries are and what the competition could potentially look like. 
At the closure of window two, I'm kind of happy to say that entries are on par still with 2019-20 at the moment, but the final deadline, which will be after window three, which uh, uh, opens tomorrow, is Friday the 16th of October. So we will use that final deadline to produce the kind of provisional leagues and member institutions are hopefully fully aware that that is the final deadline for submitted teams within the term two competition. As a part of the review of our term two competition, so the, the box leagues and knockouts program, we've also consulted on whether we will offer a knockout competition this season. We consulted with NGBs, our sport advisory groups, staff members within institutions and students as part of this process. And that's really been um, ongoing since since May really, since we started our return to play planning. So what we shared at the start of September were some recommendations based on all that consultation. Uh, and uh, those recommendations included options around whether we should include a knockout, so a cup competition uh, as part of the league program this year, or whether we should focus on a league only product. And obviously through those kind of consultation conversations, there are a couple of uh, different options that fell in between those. So we have shared those uh, with staff members within institutions and asked for their feedback and preferences. This also closed this consultation on Friday the 18th of September, so last Friday. Uh, and we're just going through processing all of that feedback at the moment. Uh, and our plan is to publish uh, effectively the result of that and the decision in terms of whether we will have uh, knockout programs uh, alongside our league program next year week commencing the 5th of October so from Monday the 5th of October although that said even though that was the timeline we originally kind of published we are looking to do that work actually ASAP so it may come out sooner but at the latest kind of week commencing uh, Monday the 5th of October so in terms of activity before term two, so uh, pre-Christmas, we've been looking at uh, an opt-in competition format for term one. Um, we opened an expression of interest back in August to see what the appetite for this might be. Uh, and then we opened up an actual entry process at the end of August for institutions to enter teams into that. The deadline for that was also last Friday, uh, and we had over a thousand uh, teams actually enter into that opt-in competition format. A couple of key things to note around that um, was we're referring it to as an opt-in competition, but effectively what we are doing is providing an opportunity to group institutions who are looking to take part in fixtures together on a very uh, regional basis, but also taking into account kind of performance level. So within our current box offering, so we're a first team or a second team currently sits within our structure and grouping those institutions together uh, to allow them to play friendlies. Now, um, we've had... Uh, over 60 men's rugby teams express interest in that offer and nearly 30 women's teams. So next Friday, we will kind of be publishing those groupings and showing a bit more information around how that offer will work. There is still an opportunity kind of for teams, institutions to be added into that if it's possible to do so based on those groupings after we go live because we appreciate the kind of the situation is changing so if you want to know any more information about that when we release the information it's getting in contact with our competitions team obviously though the caveat behind our, both our term one planned activity and our term two activity it's dependent on where the game is at that point and obviously mark's just touched on there kind of uh, the return to play plan and the stage that the RFU are at at the moment. So we are facilitating the delivery of friendlies within that context, whether they are full contact or a modified version of the game will depend on where uh, the game has developed to at that point. Obviously, from a term two perspective, we have to consider the individual home nation union plans, especially where we have cross border competitions but we believe we're flexible to adapt to what rugby looks like and to work with those different partners to make sure that we offer the most appropriate level of activity and we offer as many institutions the opportunity to play as possible. But as I said, all of this kind of caveated uh, and determined by what's going on at that time. So there's a, still a bit of waiting to do and a bit of monitoring, but we'll continue to do that um, and change our planning accordingly. So that's the update from Vox. I'm going to pass over to Katie Young now. Uh, 
Hi everybody, um, thanks Jenny. So uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm Casey Young, I'm the um, development representative for the Student Trade Union um, and I just want to give you a quick update about the grant application process for this year. Um, we have simplified the process um, with the view to just trying to help as many university clubs as possible facilitate activity um, for this coming academic year. So the application grant application guidance went out in the last University Rugby update, um, but it will also be sent directly to you following this session. Um, but we have uh, removed basically as many barriers as possible. So there's not as much requirement um, for uh, budget planning in advance. Um, you can apply for grants from £100 to £1,000 for anything that you feel will enable your club to be able to deliver activity for this coming academic year. Um, the priority is for us to sustain rugby activity in, in university clubs um, following COVID. So as long as you are um, an affiliated university club, um, and this includes partner universities and clusters, um, you can apply for funding. However, once the limited pot of money we have um, is allocated, then um, that, that will be it, unfortunately. Um, so in terms of what you can apply for, you can potentially apply for um, funding for cleaning materials, additional equipment if you don't have enough, uh, to facilitate socially distanced rugby. Um, workforce development, you might want to put members on courses um, and support them whilst we're operating slightly differently. Um, anything, it's for you to tell us what you need and we will do our best to support. So applications opened on the 18th of September and will close on the 9th of October. So you've got a little bit of time and as I say, the details will be sent out today. Um, we will then, uh, we have a panel that will be considering all the applications and we intend to inform applicants by the 19th of October whether or not um, you've been successful. Um, again, we want to prioritise getting this money out as quickly as possible for the start of term to support everybody to uh, get active and um, get rugby back going in their, their university clubs. So very brief update from me, sorry I didn't have any slides, um, but as I say, the information will be sent out directly to you. And I believe I'm going to hand over now to Phil Mooney for the Q&A. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final section of today's session. Um, for anyone that joined us for our AGM Q&A back in July, we're going to stick to roughly the same format, um, which is I'll be pitching the questions submitted by you in advance uh, to our four panellists, who I'll be introducing shortly. Um, but there'll also be an opportunity for you during the Q&A to ask any questions that you may have um, to our panellists live. Now, to do that, there's a little drop-down box uh, that should be at the top of your screen um, that says Q&A. If you put your question in there, um, then uh, either myself or one of the team um, will make sure we get to it um, and see if we can attempt to answer it um, this afternoon. So joining us this afternoon on the Q&A panel, um, I'm joined by Mark Saltmarsh uh, from the RFU, who you have just heard from, and Mark will be concentrating on questions uh, around really the, the sort of rules and regulations of the game and how the RFU are uh, adapting uh, and supporting University Rugby. Uh, Jenny Morris questions, from Bucks. All the easy questions, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. All the easy ones there for Mark. Thank you. Um, and uh, we have Jenny Morris from Bucks, who you also had the pleasure of seeing earlier. And of course, Jenny will be uh, dealing with any questions that are specifically related to the areas of the game that Bucks uh, administer. Um, we're also joined by Mark Heinemann, the SRFU Chair, um, who will be dealing with questions around specific SRFU support and of course uh, will be able to give us a brief update on the England Students Programme, hopefully Mark, 
Um, and finally, but by no means least, uh, we are joined by Phil de Glanville, uh, former England captain and the RFU council and board member uh, who represents the SRFU at that level. So welcome to you all and thank you once again for joining us for a Q&A. Um, and Mark, I'm going to start with you. Um, as always, you get the, uh, the nice juicy ones. So first off, we have a, a question coming in and uh, sorry, I should say I've clustered these questions really around similar themes. Um, so the first theme is really around sort of training and, uh, and touches on some of the elements you were talking about earlier about how we're gonna adapt training um, as we uh, adapt to the ongoing situation. And so the first question is, how will the inevitable rugby households uh, affect both transport to sessions and training bubbles within the new COVID compliance sessions? Um, it, really good question, <laughs> this one, Phil. We, um, our guidance is, is very much around the, the activity for rugby itself. Uh, and so therefore, uh, what happens before and after the sessions um, in terms of travel, transport to and from sessions to matches and all those sorts of things is, is actually more uh, along the lines of what local, uh, if they're, they're local lockdown situations, for example, is what, what that says. Um, however, what we are really keen to ensure, and it's, and it's a really key part of our plan, uh, is that we have some really strong guidance around what happens off the pitch. Um, and, and actually, uh, perhaps it's something I should have mentioned earlier, this is the piece that, that we're being challenged most by DCMS Public Health England on, there's some real clarity around what you can do on the pitch, but sport and all of us as governing bodies are really being challenged on, are we doing the right things of, of what happens with arrival, uh, leaving spectators, changing rooms, um, huddling during games, all those sorts of things are, are far more of a concern uh, in the current climate than, than actually what happens on the pitch. Um, so, so there are going to be real challenges in the education sector where you're, you're working in bubbles of, of students uh, and then transitioning them into a rugby playing environment. And this will be the same for other sports as well. Um, and this is the point I made earlier, that, that your protective measures and everything that's policy-wise for your university almost has to be in line and overlays what's in the rugby advice. And so our advice is for absolutely for what happens when you're playing rugby, but that may be overridden by a policy that you have have in your university for the movement of students to another site or the congregation of students in a certain area. Those things must be part of the consideration. Uh, that's, that's really important. And, and thank you, Mark, for really re-emphasizing that. I think it, it can be very easy to for us in, in the sport, in the particular sport, to focus on the, the recommendations for our sport. But you're absolutely right. All of these have to be carried out in conjunction with local restrictions and, and local advice. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. a really powerful message yeah. there, actually. Yeah, and we do know, Phil, in, in a, in a com community rugby club environment, all they do is rugby. They bring people in, they do rugby, and that's it. And we've been trying to be really clear that we completely understand in an education setting, that isn't all you do. There are so many other considerations and, and you have to be able to be really comfortable with following that rugby advice to be able to play rugby. We'd love everyone to start playing rugby all at the same time in line with our guidance, but we know there are so many other considerations before that. No, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, now, we, we did have a couple of questions um, around um, the, the rules around supporters with the changing uh, guidance from the government around that, but you, you addressed that earlier. So um, I just wanted to reference that that is clearly quite a hot topic at the moment is what can clubs do um, around managing that supporter issue? There's gonna be a lot of concentration on what the players are doing in training and in, in uh, non-competitive games, but actually it is an issue for, for our clubs at the moment is around managing expectations of spectators. Yeah, it is. And, and there's been some, in the last 24, 12 and 24 hours, some, some clarity around indoor sports and um, team sports. And, and that we're looking for some clarification as well that we can provide around outdoor team sports. Um, at the moment, our, our guidance stands as is, uh, but clearly, clearly the rule of six and all those sorts of things, we want to try and make sure we're able to re-emphasise what that means. So, so we're looking to do a, another piece of guidance over the next couple of days of, 
of what do the most recent government changes mean for rugby as well and that'll be sort of again overlaid on to uh, the phase d advice yeah no thank you mark um and then the next question i think is is perhaps looking forward slightly to the reintroduction of competitive rugby um and we've had a question around the possibility of adapting the rules so that competitive rugby can still take place under the circumstances. So I just wonder whether you can address that question directly, but then also address the wider um, sort of question around the return of competitive rugby. Yeah, so um, really good point. And this is the one where we're trying to get clarity on ourselves by working really closely with DCMS and government. Um, our submission last week, um, as I said earlier, was about trying to uh, have a bit more definition and, and clarity around timings for moving to phase E, which, which would include um, full contact training um, and still be able to play non-contact rugby against other teams as a preparation ready for then playing contact rugby against other teams at phase F. So, so and, and we've been quite specific in that with, with um, DCMS about what we want to do. They asked us to do that and, and when we want to do it. Now, clearly they may well come back to us now in the current climate and say moving to a full contact game as, as we know it is not going to be possible and is not appropriate at this point in time. We then are looking at what might adaptations to the game look like. Uh, and all sports are doing this, aren't they? What's the adapted version at the moment? Our adapted version under face D is ready for rugby and touch. We want to see, is there, is there a version of the game that we can adapt that in, involves contact as well? Um, and then that may well be, as Jenny said earlier, that may well be the competitive format that gets played for a certain period as well. Um, now, we had quite a lot of clarity around what we were proposing to the ECMS when we submitted last week. But there have been some, as we all know, some really significant changes since then, haven't there? So, so we're going to have to, this is where the working alongside government piece comes in. Um, and that is, that is an absolutely daily conversation at the moment between us and, and DCMS which all sports are doing and, and trying as far as we can to work together to do that as well. No, thank you, thank you Mark. Um, really really important issues at the moment and really highlights the the fluid nature um, of the situation we're dealing in, dealing with. Um, yeah. We've just had a, uh, a question come in on the live chat from uh, Joe Winpenny um, and I'd like to address it now if you could Mark because it's a, a really excellent question and that's he asks, if we train and play at an off-campus facility or local rugby club, then will the COVID risk assessment carried out by that club be sufficient or would they need their own university rugby club uh, assessment? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Joe. Hope you're OK. Um, my, my view of that is that the, the rugby club assessment is assessment for activity that happens on site. Um, there would need to be... I, I would suggest there would need to be taking a group of students from a campus to an external location. That would be need to, need to be reassessed, uh, risk assessed by the university because that's about taking groups of students somewhere um, as, a, as a, like we talked about earlier, as a bubble, isn't it? So I would suggest to, to uh, ensure there's real safety around what, has be, what the activity that's proposed is, mm. it would almost be a bit of a dual risk assessment. So the on-site stuff would, would look at the safety of them when they've arrived and their arrival and things like that. But of course, moving them from you to an external site would need risk assessing and, and be in line with the protective measures of that university as well, I would suggest. Excellent. And I was wondering whether I could bring Mark Heinemann in on that same question as a, as a head of sport, Mark, whether you wanted to add anything on that. Yeah, so, so, so we've got this challenge, uh, not necessarily with rugby, but with some, some external venues um, that we use. Um, uh, so my understanding, and, and Mark might correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the local rugby club, because it's following national governing body guidelines, would be a, a COVID secure site. Uh, and so the, the rugby club should have its own risk assessment. And what I would suggest is the university club should ask for that risk assessment because it's a legal requirement to share risk assessments related to COVID-19. Um, uh, and then 100% uh, as Mark's advised, uh, the, the rugby club itself, um, uh, so their Oxford thing, would need its, its own risk assessment to cover travel activity uh, that, that's happening on site. Um, uh, there's effectively, there's been a change in law and, and where you are a, um, a COVID secure site 
um, uh, that that site could uh, incur a fine now if, if they're not meeting those um, requirements. Um, and, and also, it'd be, it'd be different uh, for each university, so where the responsibility lies effectively. So if you're a student's union rugby club, your student's union should be leading on this and make sure that uh, risk assessment's done, probably with support from the sports department. If you're a rugby club that is delivered by the university, it's the university's responsibility. Complex as ever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the two marks. Um, moving on, I'd like to address a couple of questions to Jenny, um, if I may. So first up, um, we have a question uh, around with the new guidance and an indication that we'll be living under social distancing restrictions for up to six months. Is it really realistic that Bucks competitive leagues will restart in January? If not, what is plan B? Yeah, it's a really good question, isn't it? Um, obviously, the clarity around the messaging from government saying up to six months um, <laughs> doesn't provide any clarity at all because uh, unfortunately has been the nature of, of what's happened. Things can change overnight. Um, so from our perspective, we are planning for that January start still. I guess really until we have any hard and fast evidence that that is just not possible anymore it's no longer feasible so we'll continue to to plan entries don't close um, as I mentioned in my update until Friday the 16th of October and then at that point we will start to build the program and really kind of demonstrate what it is likely to look like next year and at that point we it, I think a lot of things will really kick in in terms of uh, making additional plans that said we do have a number of options available to us because we can be very flexible and whether that is um, a different format of the game, for example, or whether it remains at 15, a side contact rugby, we could do things where if a January start wasn't possible, maybe it was February or March, if the season be became really condensed, we could look at a cup only competition. Um, if the desire is still there for us to deliver competition. So I think the important thing within all this is for us to continue to talk to institutions and understand that as that landscape changes, what are their kind of wants still and expectations? And we will adapt to that and ensure that we offer, I guess, whatever is wanted, really. So unfortunately, not a, a very clear answer from me in terms of it will look like this or it will look like that. But the reason for that is, is so that we can remain flexible and just uh, be reactive to what's going on then. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much, Jenny. And I, I think it's probably worth saying at this point that um, all, of these, all of these answers, these questions very much uh, are subject to the huge caveat is that we are in an incredibly fluid situation and the advice from government is changing almost by the day. Um, and so we're here today really to give the best advice we can with the information we have as of today, but as of all of our panel have alluded to, that, that information could be very different in a, in a few days or in a few weeks. So it's very much, um, we will respond to that as best we can. But once again, it's a plea to really sort of stay in touch with our social media channels um, and all the normal uh, ways that we put out information in the newsletters, et cetera. Um, to make sure that you are fully up to date with the latest information. Um, Jenny, we've just had a, a question come in on the live chat. Um, it's very interesting, actually. I wonder if you, you'd like to deal with this one around, how are you dealing with the different NGB approaches to the return to rugby? And what would happen if the NGBs are not aligned in time for the proposed restart date? Tricky one. <laughs> how are we dealing with it and what will we do if they don't align yes um so how we're dealing with it at the moment obviously the activity that we've got planned for term two so the main box leagues and knockouts program isn't due to start until january so we still feel that there's time to kind of watch um, and work with partners to see what the roadmap looks like over the next couple of months so as i said there's we don't feel the need to make any definitive decisions around that programme, or certainly if we do make any, and when we publish information post that league deadline, there would still be opportunity for us to amend that and change it if the situation changed further. In terms of our term one activity, um, where we have mapped that out, it is so localised that it actually doesn't go cross-border. So actually there's an opportunity for us to work with um, different partners, different unions on that basis to make sure that the activity that's happening within that 
home nation is reflective of the situation in that home nation. So uh, effectively, um, we just need to continue to keep those communication channels open. And as I said, work together as best we can. None of us, unfortunately, have the right solution to hand. Um, and I don't think any of us have the blueprint that is the one to follow. And we're all reacting to different kind of government policy and guidelines within our different nations. So obviously, us as the the British organisation, we have to monitor all of that. And certainly working with our members in each of the home nations is incredibly important as a result as well, uh, because we need to be the kind of conduit that works between members, NGBs, and then kind of bringing our sport delivery together under that manner. Uh, thank you, Jenny. I think it's a, a really good answer under the, uh, under the circumstances. Um, I wonder if I could uh, turn to Phil de Glanville now. Um, and there's a couple of questions really, uh, I think that Phil's best place to, to answer and they're around the, the sort of wider uh, aspects of the game um, and particular the international element. Um, and first up, Phil, it's, it's not an easy one, I'm afraid, but uh, no fans in the stadium in the autumn was pitched as the worst possible scenario at the beginning of the pandemic. Now that that scenario seems a reality, what does the worst possible scenario look like now and how will it impact the game in the short, medium and long term? Yeah, that's a, that's a lovely question, Phil. Um, and, and thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I do, I, I, we have a lot of scenarios. Um, you know, when the pandemic first hit, um, you, we, we started working uh, on, on a huge number of scenarios because of the constant change um, to government guidance and obviously to the, to the virus itself. Um, if I can tell you, we're now on scenario B6 and B7 from a financial perspective, and there were a lot of A1s that will tell you how many different financial scenarios we've got. Um, just a reminder that um, obviously the games at Twickenham uh, and the men's games at Twickenham you know, fund the vast majority of what the RFU is, is able to do. Uh, three main income sources for that, the broadcasting, the TV broadcasting, the sponsorship, and obviously the match receipts, the gate. Uh, and the hospitality. So just like any other rugby club, really, um, from, from, from that perspective, in terms of numbers coming through the gate. So it's a big part of the revenues that, that come into the RFU, and those are all distributed to the game, um, either to the community game or, or to the professional game. So the impact on the revenues the RFU earns through those international matches will affect the whole game, I'm afraid, and you, you've seen that with the redundancies at the RFU recently. Um, so we, we had the scenario where we had no, um, it, these matches in the autumn were going to be played play behind closed doors, which looks now or certainty that that's what will happen. Um, the scenario is also that potentially the Six Nations in, in February and March uh, will also be played play behind closed doors at the moment too. Um, so at the moment, that's what we're working on, um, the financial impact of that whilst we protect the broadcasting uh, revenues from that, it, it does have an impact on the sponsorship. And clearly, as far as the match receipts are concerned from Gates and Hospitality, it, it's zero. Um, so you are in six figures in terms of the impact. Um, so you know, over 100 million that we will not get um, in terms of lost revenue for this year as, as a result of that in the current scenarios. So there are some other, um, some other things that could change that, game changes, um, particularly you know, if we're in a position where saliva tests are able to, um, for us to be able to, to, to confirm whether someone is COVID positive or not, literally within 15 minutes. Um, if that is developed and is available, that's a game changer for you know, all major sports events in terms of having crowds in there. Uh, means there'll be long queues getting in, but um, it, it does mean that at least you'll be able to have crowds in uh, into that. So, yeah, that's a big caveat. We don't know how far advanced that is, you know, whether it's even a reality before the Six Nations uh, or not. So at the moment, we're, we're working on, on the prudent side, on the cautious side, um, as far as uh, revenues are concerned. And it's very challenging for all of us. I think everyone's kind of talked about the day-to-day uh, approach that we're taking we, we try and plan as far ahead as we can but you know two weeks ago we were going to have you know anywhere between 10 and 25,000 people at Twickenham for the autumn series and now we're not going to have anyone um, so so that's the reality of it that we're, that we're all battling to uh, stay on top of. 
No, thank you, Phil. There's, um, there's some, some very sobering figures um, in that update. And, um, and I appreciate that, uh, that obviously, again, it's an ongoing situation that, uh, that you'll be keeping us updated with. Um, I have another question for you, but I'll, I'll just go back to Mark Saltmarsh for a while because we've got a couple of questions um, around support um, and really the, the sort of support structures for university clubs from the RFU and uh, Mark Hyman from the SRFU. So first of all, um, to Mark Saltmarsh, um, there's a question, how are smaller universities with a small rugby programme expected to maintain increased progression with a reduced budget and smaller numbers? Yeah, it's a challenge we're all wrestling with, actually, Phil, in terms of having less resource and, and people available to, to support, isn't it? Um, we, we are in getting close to a position where we're able to confirm what our structure will look like from an RFU point of view um, in, the, in the university game and more widely. Um, and what we want to try and do is, and what I think we're all going to have to do is work significantly differently, aren't we? Um, and work out ways to do things uh, that will mean we can have as much effect as we can um, when we've got less people and less resource. And certainly we're going to do a lot more uh, of, of this type of thing online. Uh, we're already talking about how uh, we can develop uh, not only webinars that give information, but, but user groups and communities of practice that actually get people to, to share that information and self-help. Um, and it's something we've done, done quite well, particularly um, in recent years through the UPOs, our university partnership officers, pulling uh, universities together and creating those opportunities. Now, what we do know is those opportunities aren't going to be the same face-to-face -face opportunities that they were, particularly in the next six to 12 months. Uh, but we want to do that sort of thing online uh, and enable our core universities, uh, partners and clusters to be able to do some of that sharing, uh, not only of uh, the challenges, but also some of the solutions to those as well. Um, so, so we're going to create those conversations. Um, we are going to have less resource, um, but there are opportunities uh, such as the one Katie talked about earlier, where people like the SRFU are really keen uh, to use resource to help people to, to um, create rugby programmes. Um, and certainly the grants programme is a, is a fantastic initiative for our core universities to be able to access to do that. Um, I don't know if Mark or, or maybe Katie would want to add anything else to that. Hey Mark, if I could bring you in there, um, if you'd like to address that from a, a, an SRFU point of view. Yeah, um, so it, it is a really challenging time. Uh, we're a voluntary organisation ourselves. And everyone's doing this alongside a, a full-time job, which is, uh, is, is pretty full-time at the moment, but as with most of the rest of the sector. Um, our, our trustee board and, and full committee um, are, are fully supportive of, of the grants fund. Um, and from our reserves, we, we've put a, um, we will be putting forward uh, this term's um, almost recovery fund, COVID related fund, uh, where we want clubs to be innovative about how they can bring back rugby, et cetera. Um, and then um, next term, there will be a follow, follow on fund um, uh, around that. Um, yeah, so, so we're really committed to it. And I, I think, um, I've been part of the SRFU for a long time, and uh, one of the good things that's come out of COVID, not that there are lots, but uh, we, we would have never done this type of thing previously. Um, so being able to facilitate members, get information out there, uh, and support them in the best way they can is, 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 is a really positive outcome. No, thank you, Mark. And uh, while I've got you on, Mark, just a, a quick 30-second quickfire question on where we're at with the latest update on the England Students Programme. 30 seconds is not going to cut it, Phil. <laughs> um, I knew I wouldn't get away with that. <laughs> um, so, so, so effectively, it's, it's, it's still a suspended status. We can't play um, full, full rugby. Um, I think I reported last time, uh, C, uh, yeah, Community Game Board has, has stopped all um, uh, aspiration rugby. Um, however, the SRFU still have it in its roadmap. Um, uh, so what we will be doing um, is working with our partners, particularly Bucks, um, because there, there is a, a um, domestic league to get up and running as and when we can. And we need to intertwine um, England students into that where appropriate. We need to work with our partners, uh, French University Rugby, uh, that need to travel across 
the channel at some point whenever that can uh, happen and, and how we overcome that. Um, uh, so, so yeah, there's, there's a few hurdles to, to overcome and um, we're, we're effectively waiting in the wings. Um, and I, I've even just had an email today uh, from, from Paul Beatty, who's our Institute's manager, um, uh, just, just trying to touch base to see where we are with it all. So it, it is firmly in our, in our sights. Um, it still remains in our roadmap. Um, we just need a number of hurdles to overcome. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, it's like you said, it's it's not an easy one to give clear answers on because the, the situation is changing so rapidly. Um, if I can come back to you now quickly, Jenny. Um, and again, we are coming to the end of our allocated time slot for this Q&A. So I might be firing a, a few fairly rapid questions uh, towards you. Um, on a similar sort of theme to the, the question I had to Mark, I wonder if you could give us an update on Buck Sevens. Yes, um, so we do have dates penciled in for Buck Sevens um, this season. So championship is penciled in for the 21st of April and the trophy is penciled in for the 28th of April. At the moment, still part of our calendar of planning, but TBC as with everything else. Excellent. That's a quick, quick fire answer there. I, I think you did a lot, a lot quicker than Mark did. That, that came in at around the 22nd mark, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, and then this one may take a bit of a longer explanation. But I was wondering if you could give us a quick update on the impact um, that the COVID situation will be having on the Bucks regulations and governance rules, uh, specifically in relation to rugby. Yes, so we are reviewing all of our governance kind of in light of COVID. Uh, our normal regulations certainly around fixtures taking place. Um, there aren't a lot of reasons as to why a fixture can't go ahead, unfortunately. Uh, there aren't a lot of um, circumstances available for institutions to rearrange fixtures given even in a normal season, um, the playing season being so condensed. So what we are looking at is reviewing all of our regulations and making sure they are appropriate. And we're taking advice kind of from um, sport governance organizations, as well as looking at what other NGBs are doing. Some sports are taking really strong stances um, on this and kind of saying that actually COVID affecting kind of fixtures, unfortunately, is going to happen and there's no caveats for that within regulations, we're going to take a much more pragmatic view uh, and look to kind of support institutions as best as possible. And that will also relate to things like local lockdowns and national lockdowns, certainly from a local perspective, where teams and institutions are affected, we'll look to support them as opposed to penalise them. So we're going through a regulation review at the moment and we'll be sharing more information kind of as those uh, rules and um, that review develops. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was, uh, that was quite impressive. And then just very quickly, final question for you is um, a question around the Women's National League and the impact um, on that really this season and whether you can give us a quick update on the planning, the revised planning for the introduction of that. Yes, so that will largely be determined really by the entry process in that window three. We need to see which institutions are in a position to compete this year, and that may have an impact on the structure. We do review our competition structures annually anyway, so really this season is no different, but obviously there's an added layer of complication around the impact that COVID has had. So I think, we're again, we're going to be quite pragmatic about it and understand that we had the National League season, the first season last year. It's probably not going to look the same this coming season. We're moving through an extraordinary period and looking to the future. So we'll just continue to kind of review that and liaise with all stakeholders to make sure it's the best possible offer um, and it's right for the women's teams that play within that structure. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, now, I'm going to try and address a couple of the questions we're, we're getting coming in uh, on the live chat. And just to once again thank our participants, um, we've had a really active uh, session today with lots of live questions coming in. Um, so this one's come in from Rob Fenner, um, and it's to do with uh, the impact on funding that, that Phil DG uh, spoke about earlier. You know, huge impact on, our, on the RFU funding with the loss of ticket sales. Um, so, Mark S., I wonder whether you could um, answer Rob's question around the direct impact that may have on the cluster officers. Will they still be available um, in the coming months? Yeah, 
Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, just building on what Phil has said, we, uh, our, our uncertainties over revenue are, um, are something that well, we're all fighting with, aren't we? Um, our intention, and, and Andrew Chaston has and the guys have spoken to the, the whole team around, uh, uh, sorry, all the, all the partners and clusters around the funding situation. Um, we want to fund a full year's worth of, of, uh, of the cluster programme. Um, and that would be our intention. However, we have to give a caveat. We, we have to be able to prioritise it with the revenues that we've got. Um, so, so our intention, as we've, have we, as we've explained, Rob, um, and I know you and, and all the other cluster officers will really want a, an answer to this question. Our intention is to provide that second tranche of funding uh, after Christmas. Um, but we have to make sure that we're, we're aligned with the revenue that we have. So, um, so I can't give you a definite answer on that. Um, and we are working with and having individual conversations with, with all of the uh, clusters and partners, which have been excellent. And it's a chance to say thank you for, for the way you, you've all entered into those discussions. Um, we're having those individual conversations to, to make sure that we can get in a, a position that, that will enable us to do what we can do, uh, funding dependent. Thank you. No, I appreciate that, Mark. Thank you for that, um, that candid answer. Thank you. Um, okay, we've only got time for just a couple more questions now. So if you have a burning question you want to ask, get it typed in the box now. Um, I'm going to take just one more pre-submitted and then we'll have a quick last scan on any that are coming in live. Um, and the last pre-submitted one is uh, a question I think uh, potentially, Phil, your best place to answer. Um, and that's really, the question is, with more hardship to come, the likelihood there's more hardship to come, and we've already talked about the, the financial impact, um, the likelihood that the men and women's and men's player pathways uh, may become under threat is very real. What opportunities are there to align or raise the profile of the education player pathway um, with this? I wonder if you could talk about that, Phil. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the frustrating thing was that um, that education player pathway was definitely uh, getting uh, more significance and traction in the RFU uh, with the new CEO and, and, and new head of performance there before COVID struck. So um, I, I, I think the performance pathways, because they lead to the major uh, income generator for the RFU, which is the, the men's and hopefully in time the women's matches, uh, at Twickenham is, is one of the most important aspects of what the RFU does. Um, so whilst, you know, everywhere is, is under pressure, uh, you kind of heard that, you know, with Salty's comments around, around uh, the clusters, you know, everywhere is under pressure to some extent. It, it, it is so important for, the, for future revenues, the RFU. It will be maintained to, to and, you know, at least a reasonable extent. Um, you know, if things do get really, really bad, um, and we're talking about, you know, behind closed doors in, uh, you know, next season, um, then, then obviously, you know, I'm sure that will have to be reviewed. Um, but uh, it is one of the most important aspects of what, of what the RFU does, just uh, just purely from a revenue generation perspective. So, so I'm sure that will be um, maintained. And I'm a firm... I'm a firm believer and an advocate of the role education plays in that, uh, particularly for late developers um, and been pushing hard as, as members of these students are, if you know, um, for, for, for the education and university sector, especially to become more formalised in, in the player pathway within the RFU. Um, so, you know, what's this space? You know, the, the, the principle has not changed um, just because we haven't got the resources necessarily to do it right now. Um, I think there's a firm belief in, in that that's right, the right thing to do um, within the RFU. It's just a question of, of timing. So, um, yeah, fingers crossed for, for the future from that perspective. Uh, thank you, Phil. Thank you. Um, now, sadly, we've come to the end of our, uh, our allotted time. So I'd just like to thank our four panellists, Mark Saltmarsh from the RFU, Jenny Morris from Bucks, Mark Heinemann, the chair of the SRFU, uh, and of course, Phil de Glanville, um, who is our council member and board member uh, for the SRFU. Um, please remember that if you didn't get your question answered today, um, do please still add it to the chat if you have time. Um, we may be able to get round to answering it later. But most importantly, please remember to follow our social media channels. Everything we know, we try and put out as quickly as we can. 
um, to our membership. Um, and if you do have any particular questions, um, also don't be afraid to ask them direct to us as well um, or via our social media channels. So once again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, and and uh, say, stay safe. Thank you.